Okay, so welcome to this video on uh, Long QT Syndrome. And in this video, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at the causes of Long QT Syndrome. And you might be wondering, well, why is what's this doing in a playlist on cyclic AMP signaling? Well, the reason I've put this uh, topic here is because actually you can get long QT syndrome in a number of different ways. Now the famous way that you can get it is by having mutations in the delayed rectifier potassium channels, and that's the most direct way you can get it. But actually you can also get long QT syndrome uh, by having mutations in, uh, in the a kinase anchoring proteins, because actually what we will see is that some of these potassium channels, one of them in particular, is uh, bound to an, uh, an A kinase anchoring protein, specifically A kinase anchoring protein 9, which is also known as YOTIO. Uh, and basically, if you have a mutation in that uh, A kinase anchoring protein, then you will get very similar problems to if you have a mutation in the um, potassium channel itself. So, right, without further ado, this is the plan for this video. We're going to start by looking at the healthy cardiac action potential. We're then going to see how uh, mutations in the channels can cause um, long QT syndrome. And then what we're going to do is see how uh, this, uh, um, this complex with the A kinase anchoring protein uh, 9 works and how uh, that will lead to um, problems and how it will lead to long QT syndrome if you have mutations in uh, the ACAP9. Okay, right, so let's start off with the healthy uh, cardiac action potential then. So let's have here uh, a cardiomyocyte. So this is a cardiomyocyte here. Let me just pull it out so I can finish this picture. So here is the cardiomyocyte. Right, so this is a um, this is a healthy cardiomyocyte at the moment, and we're going to see how uh, the action potential across the membrane of a cardiomyocyte actually works. So, how does a cardiomyocyte get stimulated initially? Well, what it has is it has electrical windows between it and its neighbouring cardiomyocyte. So let's say we have here our uh, neighbouring cardiomyocyte here. And basically, there is a connection between this neighbouring cardiomyocyte and this cardiomyocyte, an electrical window known as a gap junction. So I will just draw it as this channel here. Okay, so you have these um, gap junctions here between, um, between cardiomyocytes. And these gap junctions are found in other excitable cells as well. They're found in neurons. And there are a lot of them in the brain, basically. Uh, and they are uh, electrical synapses as opposed to uh, chemical synapses. Uh, and I think there are theories which um, link them. They've, they've been given a lot of press in recent years because of the, there, are, um, there are theories about how they are involved in consciousness. Um, however, for our purposes, they are a, a link between cardiomyocytes that mean uh, that when this cardiomyocyte is undergoing an action potential here, then uh, what happens? Well, the membrane becomes depolarized and sodium enters, a little bit of sodium enters the inside of the cell, and that sodium is what depolarizes the membrane, and it depolarizes up to around plus 20 millivolts, okay? Uh, and uh, that's a big feat uh, when you consider that the usual resting membrane potential across the membrane of a cardiomyocyte is around negative 85 millivolts, if not negative 90 millivolts. So they have a larger electrical potential difference across their cell membranes than uh, do neurons, for instance. Neurons usually have around negative 65 millivolts from extracellular to intracellular. And remember what this means. This means if I have a little man standing in the extracellular space uh, fluid, and he measures the electrical potential of the extracellular fluid, and he then moves into the intracellular compartment and measures the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment, what we're asking is how much different is the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment than the extracellular compartment. And basically, it's uh, lower by 85 millivolts. The intracellular compartment is lower by 85 millivolts than the extracellular compartment. So that's what that means. It means that the electrical potential in the intracellular compartment is lower than the electrical potential in the extracellular compartment, and it's lower by 85 millivolts. Okay, right. So, 
if this uh, neighboring cardiomyocyte has become depolarized, then uh, it means that the electrical potential in this intracellular compartment is now higher than the electrical potential in the extracellular compartment, and it's actually higher by 20 millivolts. Now, that was achieved by bringing some sodium ions, which have a positive charge, from the extracellular to the intracellular compartment. Now, these gap junctions are effectively electrical windows between the cell, and what can happen is that sodium ions can move through that gap junction into our neighboring cardiomyocyte. Now, our neighboring cardiomyocyte's electrical potential difference across its membrane was originally negative 85 millivolts, but we're now bringing in positive charge into this uh, portion of the cytoplasm here. Okay, so if we're bringing in positive charge into this intracellular compartment, then what's going to happen is that that's going to raise the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment. And if you raise the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment, then when we take the electrical potential difference across the membrane from extracellular to intracellular, what's going to happen is that that's going to get less negative, i.e. the amount by which the intracellular compartment is below the extracellular compartment is going to get less negative. So let's draw this on a graph, because you might be fear these graphs, but they are actually very helpful. These graphs where we plot voltage against time, they show us exactly what's happening, and they do actually help. Okay, so we are plotting uh, voltage from extracellular to intracellular. So I always write where we're going from and to, because obviously that is actually quite important. It's important that you understand that the electrical potential difference is the difference between, uh, in electrical potential between two points, and therefore you have to know where you're going from and to. Okay, um, uh, so uh, usually it's at around minus 85 millivolts, but now what's happening over here is that we've let in some sodium ions. So that's raising, uh, it's depolarizing the cell. It's going to mean that the electrical potential uh, difference across the membrane is going to get less negative. So what's going to happen is that you're going to get some little depolarizing portion like that. And then at a very low electrical potential, much lower than for uh, neurons, what happens is that voltage-gated sodium channels in the membrane start opening. Okay, so in the membrane of this cardiomyocyte, you have voltage-gated sodium channels, and I will draw one of these here. Now, voltage-gated sodium channels consist of an alpha subunit, which consists of four domains. So it, these cylinders that I'm drawing now are domains of a single polypeptide, basically. So one polypeptide makes up all four of those cylinders. Uh, so this is domain one, let's say here. This is domain two. This is domain three. And this is domain four. Right, and the specific voltage-gated sodium channels that you find in uh, cardiomyocytes is the NAV 1.5 voltage-gated sodium channel. So that just refers to the exact gene which codes this polypeptide that makes up this alpha subunit of the voltage-gated sodium channel. Now, there's an auxiliary subunit that can also bind here, so there's often also a beta subunit here. So this is this main pore forming subunit was the alpha subunit, and this here is the beta subunit. And together they make up the voltage gated sodium channel. But the alpha subunit alone would make a uh, fully functional voltage gated sodium channel. But the beta subunit modulates its function. Right, so what colour should I draw this in? Not pink again. We'll have green. So this is our voltage gated sodium channel, and it, the alpha subunit is encoded by this gene NAV1.5. And that determines the main properties of the voltage-gated sodium channel. Okay, so this voltage-gated sodium channel is activated to open at a very low threshold potential. So a little disturbance in the electrical potential, a little depolarization is going to activate this voltage-gated sodium channel of the NAV 1.5 type to open. Okay, so this channel now has opened, and I just want to colour in the beta subunit as well. Here's the beta subunit. So that's our voltage-gated sodium channel. So because we've slightly depolarized the membrane, this voltage-gated sodium channel is going to open.